I'm going to get some coffee. Okay, we'll keep going. Go on from there. Now, I'm Dick Weiss, uh, Chair of the Rhode Island Developmental Disability Council, and I just wanted to welcome you all to this very, very exciting day on behalf of our Council and on behalf of OSAR, who is doing all the hard work of the conference. The thing that the Developmental Disability Council has is our vision for the 90s, and this vision uh, is that the community of people with disabilities would be served by a community-based uh, support system and, most importantly, be able to make their own informed choices about running their own lives. And there are many, many steps along this path that have to be taken. Well, we had a vision for the 90s, and here we are, almost at the end of 1992, and we like to see, well, where are we? What, what are we? Where are we? One thing that has happened to the whole nation, and that, of course, is the Americans with uh, Disabilities Act. Uh, its implications, it, it's the, the biggest advance in basically in civil rights for many, many, many years. But we here in Rhode Island have taken a particular uh, tack or we have had particular accomplishments in that the state uh, has our, as I call it, our right to service law. Uh, and under this law, people with disabilities can make free choices of whether it be equipment, whether it be something that they feel will make their life better. They, they can make their own informed choices and we have a voucher system where they would be awarded vouchers to themselves paying for these services or this equipment. And there are many stories, there are many anecdotal stories of people whose lives have been improved and changed by this act. The last thing that has happened is, again, Rhode Island really has been chosen to be a leader among leaders under the CSLA, the Community Supported Living Arrangements Medicare uh, Waiver Provision. Uh, this is a federal program. It's a demonstration program in which eight states have been selected to do a multi-year demonstration, again, of community supported living arrangements whereby the people themselves with the disabilities will be able to choose things that will affect their lives. And of the eight states, Rhode Island is the only state that has been authorized to, in, uh, to use a voucher system to distribute uh, the funds under this act. And it's, a, it's very, very exciting, uh, and uh, the program is getting itself uh, underway. The only thing really I want to leave you with is to keep in mind that everything that we all do and our efforts uh, are directed toward promoting the, the independence and the productivity, the integration and the inclusion of all people with disabilities within the larger community. <coughs> And this, I know that today uh, we, uh, we're all looking forward to some things that are being done on the, on the cutting edge of this program. And uh, without any further ado, I have to turn this program over to Mary Madden, uh, the Executive Director of OSAR, who will in turn uh, introduce our presenters and uh, get the day underway. And thanks a lot for coming, and I know we're all looking forward to a great day. But you know, we have one piece of equipment working up here. <laughs> uh, I, hope you, I hope you'll bear with us for the day. Um, our, the equipment that we had ordered will be here and we'll make do in the meantime with what we've got. But um, the, the excitement of the things that we're going to be talking about today will, will really help out in terms of forgetting about these other little glitches. 
Um, before we get started today, I just wanted to take a minute to update you about some, um, some OSAR-related events that are coming up in the month of November. Uh, next week, OSAR and other events. Uh, next week, on next Tuesday, Election Day, before you go out to vote, stop in here at the Holiday Inn because there's going to be a conference on AIDS prevention, a very important topic that's being sponsored by the Rhode Island ARC, formerly RIARC. And um, if, if you need more information, we'll have some brochures at the uh, table at lunchtime. Very important. And I think there's still room for more enrollment there. OK, great. Um, next Thursday, November 5th, is the OSAR annual meeting held at the Nessa Country Club. Um, we hope to see you all there. The following week on Tuesday, November 10th, OSAR is sponsoring a conference um, tongue-in-cheek, uh, I suppose, uh, titled The Meaning of Life. This is Tony Antosh's uh, choice of title, and uh, I can't wait to go. Um, I've been waiting to find out the meaning of life for many years now. I think for the price, I mean, I think it's a real deal. If I, if I walk away, I'm seeing the meaning of life. Um, actually, we're really excited about this. Tony's done some real good work, and is, is get, just gets more radical all the time, so I think that'll be a real good program. Um, the week after that, on, on uh, Tuesday, November 17th, um, the Rhode Island Human Rights Law and MHRH Regulations Conference is going to be held. That's also going to be held here at the uh, Inn at the Crossing. This is being uh, sponsored by AAMR, OSAR, and the DD Council. And again, we have brochures on all of these upcoming events. It looks like it's going to be a very busy November, so we can help you all participate in these events. Um, now, let's move on to today, since we're already running a little bit behind schedule. Um, I, just a couple of comments. We uh, are going to be taking a break a little bit later because of our delayed starting. We had originally um, agreed to offer you half hour for your break. I'm reneging on that promise. You only have 20 minutes, and your punctuality is really important. Um, we find it very difficult to get people back from breaks in 20 minutes. Um, please, please watch the clock and get back soon because we have a very limited amount of time today. So your break will run from 10.45 to 11.05. Um, your lunch will be at 12.30 in um, the atrium, which is down the hall. Um, if you ordered a vegetarian meal, please let somebody know when they come by your table. Um, also, between 1 and 1.30, we'll have a table set up out here with some books. Um, the, uh, the speakers have brought with them copies of the whole community catalog. If you haven't seen this book yet, it's an incredible deal. It's a wonderful resource. Um, I'm not here to plug a book, but, but um, it happens to be something that I've got and use all the time, and it's a real nice resource. So that will be available between 1 and 1.30. Uh, we'll have a table right up here at registration. OK, I think that's all the scheduling logistics. Um, today's conference is, is real exciting and real timely for all of us that have been involved in, in CSLA, for all of us who have been really trying to move, make some systems change and move closer to consumer empowerment. These are things that we've been talking about for a long time, and we're just really beginning to see happen in the state. And I think that it's really exciting to bring some folks in who have experience across the United States and Canada who can tell some stories that maybe will help us and inspire us in the work that we're trying to do here in Rhode Island. So I think I'll turn it over to David Weatherow and then let you go on to introduce the rest of the panel and your cohorts and explain how the rest of the day will go. Thank you. happening periodically through the morning. I'm largely cold this morning, so uh, if you bear with me, struggle through that. I'm, I'm Dave Weatherow. I'm, the, uh, I'm connected with the Association for Community Living, which is like an ARC, in Winnipeg, Manitoba, which is a cold, flat place in the middle of Canada. I love coming to New England, anytime I get a chance to come to New England, I just jump at it. Because I think I think my heart's here. I think in, in some previous incarnation or something like that, I was I was born here because when I first started coming here, I got this feeling that this this is home. This is this is a uh, the, the kind of place that you could uh, settle into and let your soul rest. 
I never get that feeling on the prairie. The prairie is, uh, it's about some other things. So I, I appreciate the chance to, uh, to come here and be with you for a couple of days. And uh, I'm honored by the, uh, by the invitation. My colleagues are from this part of the country, more or less. Um, George Ducharme is from Connecticut. He's the, the founder and president of Communitas International, which is an international association focused on helping communities and, and, uh, and families work toward full inclusion and work toward building, uh, building some of the kinds of circles of support and circles of commitment that people need. George will tell you a little bit more about that effort when he starts talking. And Don Trice is originally from Boston, but who I first met in Atlanta, Georgia about, uh, about 10 years ago now. And uh, Don and I have a rather checkered career together because we did some past training together about 10 years ago and stayed in contact. I brought him up to Manitoba to do an evaluation to the child welfare system that uh, was a, a very, very tricky bit of business, a very tough bit of business. And the result of that, performing that assessment, was that I lost my job. <laughs> Don got, got to go back to Georgia and, uh, and, and talk about this, this brave excursion to the, uh, to the Flatlands. So I moved, uh, I moved on. When uh, we were talking, or the, the speaker earlier mentioned about choices and, uh, and empowerment. One of the things that that always brings to mind is the, the, the choice is based on the range of experiences that we have. That uh, if, you don't, if you don't know about pistachio ice cream, you may not, you may not choose that just at random. And I come into this field in a slightly different way than probably most of you do, and certainly than my, than my friends do. Uh, I, I came into the field as a civilian, as somebody who had no training and no, no particular background in this work. I was involved in data collection, computer stuff, program evaluation, uh, but, but sort of from a scientific, technical point of view. And it, it took me a very long time to realize that my, my vision about this business was very, very limited, and it was structured, it was created by the experiences that I'd had growing up, and also by the way the world was interpreted to me when I first got into the, into the field, which happened to be in, in mental health and uh, health services in, in Colorado and San Francisco. I grew up in the United States, lived in 11 different places because we, we moved a lot. My dad had worked in the retail field. And I went to, uh, went to 11 different schools as I was growing up. I never once met a child in a wheelchair in all those first 12 years of my life. I never met a child who <coughs> couldn't see or who, who had vision problems or who had hearing problems. I never met a child who had serious emotional difficulties or serious learning difficulties. And that was Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Chicago, Binghamton, New York, Charleston, West Virginia, Denver, San Francisco. Those kids were all someplace else and always somewhere else as I grew up. I didn't meet those people until I wandered onto the grounds of a state home and training school in Wheat Ridge, Colorado, and discovered people with disabilities all in the same place. And I had the same reaction that everybody else has who makes the, the discovery that way, which is that I got away as fast as I could. My feeling was uh, one of shock and surprise and some, some real distress and anxiety and saying, it's, I understand why they have these places. We have had forgotten somewhere along the line how to how to hold people in the context of community and there's a long a long history about that but what that meant for me was that my vision of what to do with and about people with disabilities was limited to that 
to that model. But basically, uh, I'm going to move this. Here. Taking people out of the uh, out of the world and sending them into orbit, sort of like the Challenger yeah. space station. Yeah. Yes. Uh, there's you get an interesting view of the world from up there, but one of the costs is is that we're disconnected from all of the people and relationships and, it's, and institutions in the community sense. And, and history and process of the world. We have to import everything into this place. Remember with the Challenger, they have to bring the oxygen and the food and the water up, and they have to, to really be careful about, about everything. Everything costs money as it goes up. There's nothing for free. There's a lot of stuff for free down here, but there's nothing for free up there. So as we created these special places, we created places where the where the economics start to look a lot different than they do down here. We created places that convinced all the school divisions that I grew up in that they had no business and no role and no capacity to include kids with disabilities. We convinced our friends, our neighbors, our moms and dads, our neighborhoods, our workplaces that we had no capacity and no and no role. In this. As a matter of fact, what I was told by Jerry Lewis and by all the other fundraisers is that my job as a citizen was to raise money to be a, a fundraising auxiliary for this effort to send the space shuttle in order. When I first got into the field, I worked in and around these places. And then around the beginning of the 70s, we started discussing the some of the problems in these places, and said the problem was is that they were too big and too disconnected from the community. So we started breaking them down. We went from the institution, cracked off the piece that's a residential ward, and created group homes. We cracked off the piece that was the, the day room or the occupational therapy center, and created sheltered workshops. And, and probably, I, I know George and, and, and Don, and probably a number of the people here, were involved and have been involved in, in deconstructing the institution. But one of the things that, because I didn't have another way of thinking about this, one of the things that that meant was that it never occurred to me that there was a different model, there was a different way. Not just making them smaller, grinding it out finer, but, but, it, but a whole different approach, a different paradigm to this. Uh, we went from 600 bed to 16 bed to 12 bed to 8 bed to 4 bed group homes. A woman in, a friend of mine in uh, Kenora, Ontario, is a cartoonist, draws this picture of an institution going in some kind of a processing machine, one direction, and a whole bunch of group homes tumbling out the other end. I did that. A lot of us did that. There's a woman in Madison, Wisconsin, named Marcia Lovejoy, who was a who described herself as a survivor of the mental health system in the state of Wisconsin. She was in an audience about this size, looked at that, and she said, "My God, that's exactly what happened to me." She said, "That's it," because she had lived in all of those, all of the different variations on that thing. And she said, "You know what? It tastes like liverwurst." You know what? I can't stand liverwurst. I hate it. The flavor doesn't change. I, as, as we started to see that, we, we really go into a period of, of struggle, saying, well, if we, if we send one of these into the same, into the same grinder, are, are we going to do the same thing? Are we going to accomplish the same thing? And for a long time, all we could think of were ways of grinding this out finer and finer. The model was still one of community somewhere here. And people in isolation. And it seemed that our job was to surround them with services to make up for the fact 
for their lack of connection to the community and to deal with the, the brokenness, the disabilities, the, the parts of them that weren't functioning properly. So a lot of the main models that I had in my mind were, were sort of three impulses. One was the impulse to fix, the impulse to repair and to, and to solve things at a clinical level, special education, all the special physiotherapy and, and, and the sort of clinical hospital medical model of things. I understand that in terms of getting my, uh, the, sort of the closest experience I have that is with the Ford Festiva that I've got that I can no longer work on because the technology is so advanced that it's, it's impenetrable to me. So I have to take it to a special place where they know how to do that. And, and get it fixed. And for a while, I'm disconnected from my car while the experts are working on it. It goes in one end, it finally comes out the other end, and it's repaired and I can drive it again. That, that impulse created the schools for the blind, the mentally retarded, all these, other, all these other special places, the special hospitals, the rehabilitation centers. The problem was is that in the process of take, putting people into orbit, we forgot how to bring it back. We forgot that there's the issue of, of, of landing again. And as a matter of fact, our, our primary conviction was that you couldn't land until you were repaired. The Ford doesn't come out of the shop until it's done. And if it's not done, you put it, you, you recycle it. People kept recycling or getting stuck in these places. The first time I really understood that was in Children's Special Services in Manitoba, Mental Health Services where I understood that what we were doing with kids was kind of like a microwave oven model of mental health. We would take them out of the community, put them in the microwave oven, turn on the power and cook them until they were, until they were done, until they were ready to go back and function in a, in a very complex world. And if that didn't work, we sent them to another place and another place and another place. We, Don and I visited places where kids had lived in 12 different settings by the time they were eight or nine years old. And they were shattered emotionally by that experience. They were shattered in their, in their understanding of what it means to be in community with each other. And we would label them sociopathic and send them to send them deeper into the system. At that point, we'd say, this kid needs relationship therapy. So we'd send them to a level four place, which was the place that Don and I evaluated, and hire good people. And somewhere in that place, a communication would start, a connection between a staff member and one of these shattered kids would start. And their heart would open up a little bit. And they'd, they'd, they'd drop some of the armor and some of the fear. And they'd start to get into a real working relationship with this person. And their, their resistance would begin to melt. And then as an administrator who is in charge of making sure that the throughput is working and that we're using these services most economically, I would say, you know, that kid's looking pretty good. She, it looks like she's done. We'll move her on to a level three setting because there's another level four kid waiting to get into this place. We created another discontinuity in her life. This was crazy. And the craziest thing was is that the kids would drop off the edge at the age of 18 and go into a community that had no history with them, no understanding of them, no commitment to them, not even a commitment to keep them safe. There was something fundamentally wrong with that with that law. But the but, but repair of the heart, and sometimes repair of the body, and sometimes special knowledge does need to happen. It does need to be available. But we package it in a way that hurts people and that hurts communities. Another impulse is the impulse of asylum. Because a lot of the kids and a lot of folks got into those systems because the community didn't like them, didn't understand them, was afraid of them, was terrified of them. And, uh, and abused and neglected and rejected them. And we brought people in. In, in George's town, there's, um, there's a place called Asylum Avenue, which is one of the biggest, biggest streets in, in um, Hartford, Connecticut. The idea of sanctuary 
is not a bad idea. Just like the idea of curing is not a bad idea. The idea of, saying, of providing people safety and sanctuary is a noble concept. But again, we did that in a way that stripped people away from, from the heart of the community. There are, there's another impulse that really, that really didn't occur to me until actually about six months ago, and that's the impulse that says, take this cup away from me. We don't want, as a family, as a neighborhood, as a school, to look at this. We don't want to deal with it. We don't want to carry it. Please take this cup away from me. And we've done that as a state as well, and as a, as a culture as well. As we've brought people back, and we've started to bring people into what, in the early years of, of my involvement, was the stage setting of the community, the group home in the stage setting of, of a residential neighborhood, the sheltered workshop in the stage setting of an industrial uh, of an industrial park. One of the things that became apparent was people's isolation and loneliness. The fact that we could even we could even make these places very very small, a two person apartment in a high rise in Toronto, Ontario, which is as, which turned out to be as institutional in its nature because it was still a space capsule on a very small scale as anything we'd ever seen. People were, the fundamental issue that people were struggling with was their isolation from the normal human connectedness and, and variation in the community. About that time, the time that we were struggling with all this stuff, I was raising little kids and ran into a, uh, a cartoon. I don't know if you get the Family Circus cartoon down here. It's the one that's in the circle. And uh, it's Mom and Dad and Jeffy and, and, uh, and the little kids. Mom is changing the baby's diaper on top of a clothes dryer. And Jeffy's down there. Jeffy was little at the time. He's down there looking up and he says, Mom, if babies don't come with instructions, how do mommies know how to work them? <laughs> that, that question kind of got into my head and rattled around for a long time and started cutting a bigger and bigger swap. That's a really interesting question. How do we know how to work them? How do we know the, the incredible detail of raising kids? Not just diapering and getting stuff in and out, but, but, but knowing how to bring children into the, into the family of, of humanity how to help them uh, learn the things that they need to learn, how to help them get the connections that they need to get, how to help them uh, become responsible, loving, happy, productive human beings. All that information is in the back of our heads. Moms and dads really know how to do that. And we never went to school for it. That was never part of our curriculum. And in fact, the school part of our curriculum said that the world is about competition. The world is about being number one. But somehow in the back of our minds, we have all this information about how to bring people into the, into the family, about how to, uh, how to create conditions for our kids so that they can move forward into their lives. And the, the amazing thing is that most of the time, that works. I mean, look at your moms and dads did it for you. They knew how to do it. That model, there must be, that, that means that there's a kind of invisible model in the back of people's heads when they become parents of what this is going to be about. Now, my experience was that you learn this from your kids as much as you learn it from your prior experience and from knocking around in the culture. Living with my children was like living with three Zen masters in the household. I never. I, I could never get away with anything for very long because they because they tell you. But but somehow or another that that thing that makes that happen disappears when a child with a disability comes or came into our families. We go into confusion. We lose track of of how to create the experiences and the learnings and the connections and the, the self-identity. Why is that? Why does so much of that disappear? Why do we go into such deep confusion about that? 
Part of it is because most moms and dads grew up like me in a world without people with disabilities. We never saw each other. We were frightened to death of each other. Part of it is because as we, as we began to reconnect, and I've, I've committed this particular sin a lot in my life, we start to give families the message, the families kind of in the middle. I think I may have even drawn this one. Um, it's mom and dad and this new kid. A lot of the messages that we give families as professionals is to say to the family, your primary job is to, is to work the boundary with the service system. Your primary job is to be good consumers, good case managers, good advocates, good lobbyists for this related to the service system. Our infant development program in Manitoba has some stuff about there are some things that you can do to encourage this child's development and support this child's development. But 80% of the message is we want to help you get good at working this set of connections. There's something missing in that because we're not as strong at saying to families, it's also important for you to get good at working the connection with the, with the community and understanding that we have to be more deliberate about that, that we have to be more, uh, more consciously inviting of those, kinds of, of those kinds of relationships. That didn't completely connect with me until my brother and his wife had a little girl with Apert's syndrome about, uh, about six years ago now. Apert's syndrome is a syndrome where the bones in the head and the skull are all sealed together they're not, they're not loose, the growth plates aren't separate. And so all the bones in the, in the head and the face are kind of fused together. And in addition to that, her, uh, her hands and feet weren't fully developed, so there was sort of a mass of structure here rather than fingers or, or even the beginnings of fingers, and the same thing with her feet. Bill and Nancy were, went into a state of, of absolute horror and fear and panic and guilt and uh, a deep sorrow about the birth of this ch child and terribly shocked about the birth of this child. Remember, they grew up in the same world that we all did, without folks with disabilities. And uh, Don, actually, I think, I, I think you were in Winnipeg when that, when that happened. We got the call from my dad. And uh, we were involved in a task force together. And I thought, well, I'll go out and teach them normalization. I go out and do two weeks of training. Exactly. I found out that they were really only going to be able to hear maybe one or two things. They really didn't even want to hear that this child might not be retarded. That was very, that was interesting to me. Because I had done some research and, and, and found that that this doesn't necessarily mean mental retardation. They didn't want to hear that. It was like the rug had been yanked out from them so hard that they didn't want to set themselves up for another disappointment by being, by being at all optimistic about this child's prospects. So when I realized that they were only going to be able to hear one or two things, and Dawn and I had just come out of an experience of, of 10,000 things, of looking at 10,000 things, and said, what are the one or two things that are, that are essential. What message can I leave with them that will allow them to kind of move forward in, with this child's life? What's the bottom line? Sort of like, what's it all about, Alfie? And, uh, and that was a real wrenching experience for me, was to boil down the 10,000 things that we've been dealing with and say, what's, what's the core of this? And, uh, the, the, the great thing was is that that's, that's, it, it turned out to be a graced question because the answer was this. I, I said, this child's life, this child's experience, the way she experiences her existence is going to depend more than anything else on whether or not there's a circle of people around her who know her and who have known her for a long time, who love her, who are delighted in her, who aren't afraid to touch her, and who aren't afraid of her disability. 
and who believe that they have something to do with creating her future and that she has something to do with creating theirs. The kids play this game of uh, the church. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Open the door and see all the people. And all the people, your church or your community or your extended family, have dozens of connections, have powerful identities, have the possibility of creating new relationships and, and, and inviting and accompanying people into new relationships and into new opportunities. When we strip somebody away from the community, we take them away from all that richness and then try to replace it with vocational services and residential services and and other kinds other kinds of uh, institutional solutions, whether it's in a big house or not. The reason that I left Bill and Nancy with that idea was I said that the, the correlate to that is when the system comes to you and offers stuff, one of the things that you need to do is look at whether there's this solution, this course of action, is going to strip her away from that circle of friends. It's going to take her away physically and geographically, or it's going to take her away symbolically. Because if people get convinced that only experts can deal with her, then they don't have a relationship with her. They become afraid of her disability. They become afraid of interfering with her disability. But if people can become convinced that, that, that they're going to be part of creating a future for her, that makes sense. Quick story. When I, when I got thrown out of university and uh, went back home in disgrace, I was looking for a job, and I was smokestacking. I was going around looking at the, for the, the big smokestacks, the big companies filling out forms. Nine, 19 years old, couldn't find a job. It was tough slugging in, uh, in Colorado at that time. Our neighbor up the street who played chess with me for every Wednesday night for three years was an estimator in a printing company. Tom knew the situation I was in. And I think actually created a job for me, uh, running cards through an IBM machine, through one of these old jobs that were wired rather than uh, with micro switches. And uh, I got good at that. And over the course of time, Tom taught me his profession, he taught me how to, how to be an estimator. It turned out that he had a dream, which was to leave that job and go run a small town newspaper in, in northern Washington which is what he's doing now. But he gave me my first profession, which is why I'm here, because there's kind of a path from that experience to all the other things that happened after that. And it didn't occur to me until about 30 years later that if Tom had been wearing his corporate hat, he wouldn't have done that. He would have hired somebody who knew something about printing, knew something about estimating, uh, who was older and more mature and had more social graces. And he picked this disgraced 18-year-old kid because there was a, we had a relationship, we had a commitment. So if you open the door and see all the people, everybody goes someplace during the day. Everybody has the possibility of, of inviting and introducing me or Allison or Amber to other places. But when we, when we try to bring people back from having been in orbit, that's real hard to do, right? Because first of all, our relationships are primarily in this field. One of the things that I realized after about five years in Winnipeg was that I didn't know anybody outside of the human services. We had moved there from, from far away. I didn't know a single person who had who had another kind of identity in the community. And also, I was responsible for a whole lot of people. So I might be able to transact connections for one person, but I'd use up all my friendships in doing that. I couldn't, I couldn't make the next step. John McKnight is a professor of uh, community building, community development at Northwestern University, captured this dilemma about, uh, I guess it's about eight or ten years ago now, and began to help us understand the difference between this side of things 
in this side of things. And John's symbol for things organizational is the uh, is the triangle, the the um, organizational chart, the shape of the organizational chart. His symbol for the community is a circle, which can expand and contract, and which is characterized by consent rather than control. That we're in relationship with each other in community by virtue of our consent to be in each other's lives. So the circle of friends around Allison needs to be there by consent. We can't order these people to do this. We can invite them to do that and encourage them, but we can't instruct them to do that. This is a good form of organization for running an airline. I'm glad when I came here on Northwest that there are people who are very, very reliable about things like engine parts and, and navigation systems. But that's not where my life comes from. I need it for, in, in understanding this, to have a little more detailed map of the community. The, the circle and sort of the, that this, these general understandings about consent rather than control, about stories rather than data, about our legends and experience together rather than, uh, rather than management processes and, and policy manuals made sense to me. But I needed a, more, a slightly more detailed map. It's kind of like when I first moved to Winnipeg, Manitoba was a blank place on my mental map, and then it had a little circle of a city in it. And as I, as I lived in there, I got to know, I got to, to know neighborhoods, particular streets, and, and I could sort of watch the map come, coming together in my, in my mind. What we realized as we talked about this and, and worked with this over a number of years is that there's a range of relationships in the community, ranging from just proximity and neighboring relationships through associating, associating together in church, in chess clubs, in all the ways that we associate through friendship and deeper and deeper commitments in friendship to what we've ended up calling covenant relationships. Relationships of the heart, but also relationships where there's a promise. Your connection with your family is a covenant relationship. You're always going to be a part of your family. And they're always going to have a special bond and special connection and a special responsibility to you and you to them. And at the bottom end of the scale are exchange relationships, relationships that are simply based on an exchange of value of one kind or another, relationships of control, and the worst of, of exploitation or oppression. And I sort of draw those outside of, outside of community. They're not really part of community. They're sort of outside of what, what John McKnight means by community. If our model of bringing people with disabilities back into the community is to put them in a stage setting and surround them by services, we're missing all of this. We're missing all those connections. And as you think about your own life, the things that make your life rich and, and strong and lovely and bring you to tears and bring you to laughter are the connections of the heart, the connections where we're involved in enterprises together, the connections where we're involved in, in, in friendships and in, in the care of each other, and the connections of, of um, of commitment and of covenant. We're all looking for love. That's a big theme in our society. If you think about where your friendships and where your connection with your spouse or your main squeeze, as I saw it related yesterday in the airplane, your main squeeze came from, it's it's always in the context, almost always in the context of doing something else together. Tom Baker and I were in a neighborhood together. We planted trees and, and uh, played chess together. That, that resulted in something else. 
uh, my best friends I met in university or I met in, in the course of work or I met in the past course in Atlanta, Georgia. Georgia and I met about, about seven years ago. And it's sort of like the, the song, you see a stranger and, and across a crowded room, there's some kind of a connection that starts that says, let's see where this goes a little beyond this moment a little beyond this enterprise, a little beyond this, uh, uh, this sort of proximity connection that we have. And George and I have ended up being good, good friends and, and getting into all kinds of trouble together. When we strip somebody away and limit that friend-making activity to some kind of managed service, we're just not in a very, we're just not in a very um, wide range of opportunities. Kids start out in the context of their family, and I think move downwards this way. We're very often with people with disabilities, starting them out down here, and trying to move them upwards into those kinds of committed relationships. It's very, very difficult work, especially because we learn to be so afraid of each other. We started to look at the question of what covenant relationships are available in the community. I guess if I had to have a choice of one of these and missing the rest of them, it would be this one that I'd like to be in. It would be the, the primary relationship with the, with a spouse or with a lover or with the, or with the family. If I had to have a choice, thank God I don't. It takes about 250 people to keep me going. The covenant relationship seems to have about three or four main characteristics. One is that there is a there is a promise. There is a commitment. You know it from the marriage ceremony. For, for better or for worse. For richer or for poorer. In sickness and in health. It includes the times when we get littler. It includes the times when we get when we're not able to give as much because exchange is not as big of an issue. It often involves some kind of a public ceremony, some kind of a public event. Sometimes it, exchange, it involves a change of names or an exchange of names. It always involves sharing a social space. Your people will be my people. Your God will be my God. Wherever you go, I will go. Exchange, it, it involves sharing social space and sharing a social status. It involves the sharing of the, of the goods of life, of the means of, of life. Uh, if, I, if I win the lottery on Saturday night, my kids and I will share in that. We won't, uh, you know, we won't separate because we no longer need each other. If I lose my job, as a result of, of uh, having been away too long, or something like that, come to Rhode Island. Uh, we'll, we'll share that experience together. We won't, we won't separate because of that. We'll just tough that out together. But I don't have my property in my house, and, and, and my children having their property. So there's a kind of sharing that goes on that's, that's and, and a kind of commitment that is, uh, as one person called it, um, it's unconditional and it's also kind of irrational. It doesn't make sense from a lot of perspectives. It's a special kind of relationship. Family, adoption, marriage, some kinds of clan or, or religious relationships are like that. The sisterhood and the brotherhood of, of nuns and monks is like that. Uh, there's a commitment to poverty, chastity, and obedience, but also stability. Also a commitment to stay together as a community and work things out as a community. We don't have very many other examples in our culture of covenant relationships, of that kind of commitment. But we know that for the people that we're talking about, for our friends and family members, that that's really what we want. When I thought about Allison, my brother's child, I know that what she really needs in her life are covenant relationships. Whether she's real smart or not, 
whether she gets her hands fixed or not, whether she gets her face fixed or not, those are the kinds of things that she that she's going to need. When I think about my friends in uh, in Winnipeg, I know that that's what we want for them. And then the question becomes, how to invite that for people who aren't necessarily going to find that in the context of family or in the context of marriage or in the context of, a, of an intentional religious community. Part of the work that George Ducharme has been doing is one form of inviting that kind of thing into the lives of people with disabilities and their families. The idea of circles of support in an intentional, sustained circle that operates along with the fact that people will still need some professional services. Allison's life is going to be based on that circle of friends. But thank God there are people who know how to do the microsurgery, right? Who, who, can, who can get in there and redo the bones in her head and have computer topography or whatever it is that they use to predict where those growth patterns are going so that her face comes out as, as attractive as possible. And the people who, who were able to take that mass of flesh and create, I think, three fingers and a, and a thumb. This kid's amazing. When she had just this much of a thumb, she could eat spaghetti with it. <laughs> it's great. She figured out, she, she, she keeps pushing past her disability all the time. But, but we, might, you know, we might not be able to do that. That's, that's irrelevant. Uh, I have a little friend who I'll, I'll show some slides about who's 11 years old, who has cerebral palsy, living in the context of a wonderful family. Thank God there are people who are really skilled at the, at the physiotherapy issues, the ways of teaching us about how to hold her without hurting her and how to help her stand and, and develop the growth plates in her hips that have the special knowledge about augmentative communication systems and facilitated communication that are allowing her to express herself, that those skills, those talents, the knowledge that we have as a community of interest in this area, the knowledge that you have as a community of interest, is, is a godsend. And the question is how to bring that into people's lives in a way that's balanced, that doesn't strip folks away from the heart of the community, and that's in right relationship with the community. And I think the issue is right relationship rather than an anti-professional or anti-organizational stand on things. It's a, it's a question of the proper kind of, of, of balance. Another way that we thought of, and I'll say this because I promised that we would say something about this, of inviting covenant. So George, the, the circle of friends, in the way that George is, is doing the invitation and his colleagues, I think is a new form of covenant relationship in our community. There are some others that we've created uh, around the idea of co-ops, of, of cooperatives for housing and employment that have been basically ways of inviting people into relationship with each other. About eight years ago, we started a housing co-op in Winnipeg that was an designed as an inclusive community. So a lot of people are struggling with the issue of housing. Let's create a co-op that deliberately includes informed community with people with disabilities. It doesn't just have a handicapped wing, but that says what we're about is creating neighborhood together, creating an intentional circle together. We started that on a, on a kind of small scale, scattered basis. I told the story to, uh, to a group of people in Springfield, Massachusetts about five or six years ago. George picked up on it and communicated it to somebody who was trying to figure out how to work the next stage of her life. And uh, this fall, this spring, uh, her co-op opened up in Manchester, Connecticut, a 16-unit cooperative where there are four units that are specially designed for people with, with major mobility issues. And uh, I've had the pleasure of walking into that community, for one thing, seeing the whole middle, middle yard of this thing with, uh, with all kinds of tricycles and kids running around and, and the kitchen space, the courtyard, and people are 
are working things out in community with each other. That becomes possible when we're not doing group homes. I think it's tougher when we're when we create a place that's separate from the community, psychologically and symbolically separate from the community. The co-op, it's important to remember, is not a formula for creating inclusion, but it's just one way of inviting people to be connected to each other. And I think in some ways, the fact that it took Kathy five years to develop her cooperative is going to make that a stronger community because people slugged it out over a five-year period of time. They got to be friends with each other. They, 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 they saw each other through really through times of real test. And they saw each other through in times of, of depression and, and desolation. I think that's, that's the basis for a very powerful community as opposed to something that's just delivered to folks. They manage it together. They're responsible fiscally for it. They've got to work things out. There's a commitment and processes for keeping issues on the surface rather than running underground. It's a good experiment. It's not a formula. And it's important not to get locked into the idea that that's the only way that we can do that because there are thousands of ways that we can do that. When we developed a house and support system for a woman named Catherine Schaefer in Winnipeg, uh, that was a big breakthrough. And I'll tell you a little bit about that particular story. The Catherine is 20, 29, 30 years old right now. She is the person that the institutions are designed for. She has multiple and severe handicaps, a list as long as you are. Her mom would kill me if she heard me use this label, but she would be labeled someone with profound mental retardation. She's physically handicapped, she's got scoliosis, uh, she's medically fragile, meaning that you could lose her in about 10 minutes if you didn't know what to do. There are times when she's got to have very intensive interventions on, on the medical side of things. Uh, she has uh, sometimes controlled and sometimes uncontrolled seizures. We haven't figured out a way to allow her to express herself in language. She expresses herself in some other ways. But she's the person around whom we develop things like the St. Amon Center in Winnipeg with all the nursing care and, uh, and all the special equipment. Kate lives in a house, actually started out in her family's house, and her mom didn't forget how to work the baby. So Catherine grew up. Part of Nicholas' solution was to have two more kids and a dog to, to richen it up a little bit. Instead of group therapy, she just had more children. Uh, when Catherine was about, was, when Nicola was trying to figure out what to do, the only formula she could come out with was a 22-bed nursing home because she knew that Catherine would need at least one 22nd of a physiotherapist. And the only way you could create that was, would be a small institution. And we pointed out the fact that here she was living in a regular house on Oak Street with a mom and dad who weren't experts in this area and a dog who wasn't an expert in this area but was quickly becoming so and that they were in an okay relationship with the medical community and with physiotherapy and with special devices and that sort of thing. Why not move forward from a family model rather than backwards from an institutional model? So we said, what would that look like? Well, for one thing, it would separate out the provision of housing from the provision of support services so that Catherine could change support services could fire her support service or get fired by her support service and not lose her house. Because what we were going to create in the house was some intentional community. Catherine and her helpers on the ground floor, two apartments, a family, and a single apartment up here, they all connect through a kind of main foyer. These people are paid to be there. And there's a little co-op that administers that. But the house is independent of that. If Catherine needed to change venue, if she needed to change service providers, she could do that. And she's not going to lose this set of connections. When we did the renovation on the house, we used a local group of Mennonite carpenters to do the reconstruction rather than the Genstar construction company. 
because those guys were on site and their wives and families were on site for a whole long summer while we built the house and, and Catherine was on site. We made sure that they got to know each other. At times when it's been tough, at times when Catherine's gotten sick and this house has needed more support, we've been able to call on that community. At times of staff change, we've been able to call on that community for connections. We realized that staff would change, that people would come in and kind of make a commitment to Catherine for maybe two or three years at a stretch. I think it's unusual to get a lifelong relationship, although we've had a couple of those, we've seen a couple of those. But then people would move on. It was really important for there to be a lot of expansion and stability to Catherine's situation so that when the staff changed, that wasn't like everything in her life changing. So we made sure that there were some components that would be there as, as those changes occurred. The mom, the neighbors, the other people in the housing co-op. This little cooperative, which is called Lavenir, which is French Canadian for the future, uh, is, a, is a service agency that refuses to buy houses. It just says, we're going to support people in whatever context they happen to be living, but we will never own or control the property that people live in. And they serve, uh, they serve 18 people, 18 or 19 people. A couple of rules of thumb. Money that comes in for Catherine can't be spent on somebody else. Another rule of thumb. Catherine and her family are the membership, create the membership, which creates the board of directors, which runs the organization. They've got control at that level. It's governed by the members and, uh, and people like Nicola, who are who are, are able to speak for folks who can't speak for themselves. We've done this sometimes at a very small scale. And I think that's, that's been an interesting experiment in another form of gathering a circle into people's lives. And it is one that it sounds like you're kind of on the verge of experimenting with here. Uh, a small circle of friends who says, we will also organize in a way that allows us to receive the money from the government rather than running the money through an agency. Uh, dropped that idea at a meeting four years ago in Vancouver, BC. Somebody from the Ministry of Health and somebody from the Housing Association heard it and said, let's do it. And I went back two weekends ago and talked with people representing 16 of these arrangements in the, in the province of British Columbia. They call it the microboard model. Uh, it just means five people who get together and say, we'll, we'll be community for you. And we will also be the, the entity that receives the money from the government and, and, and relates back to the government. They've learned a lot about how to, how to support that kind of thing. Their job description is interesting. They said their first job as a, as a group is to is to recognize that person's gifts, to think real hard about that, to think about how to help the person express their gift in the community. A second is to uh, support the relationship, the caregiver relationship at the center of the household, and give these folks a chance to talk about what they're experiencing. Third job is to be friends, to be community for the person. The fourth, so we don't need another program to do that. The fourth job is to be a bridge builder to other relationships and other trusted connections. The fifth is to help with stewardship, with the management of the resources. The sixth is to look after the quality issues in Catherine's life, which means developing a real clear sense of what, that's, what that means for, for Catherine. The seventh is to uh, be a source of continuity, to make sure that other people know what you're doing and who can come in and replace you if you're no longer able to do that so that this thing doesn't fall apart when somebody moves. Eighth job is to relate to the government, to do the minimum amount of accountability to the government that will keep the thing going. And the ninth job is to make sure that the eighth job doesn't drive the other seven out of whack, that we forget to be community for each other, because that very often happens. The stuff that's written down tends to become the most important stuff. So their agenda for the board of directors meeting, or for their micro board or circle meeting, is to say, how are we doing on the first seven jobs? And, uh, and what do we have to do? 
what's the minimum essential amount of accountability about the reporting we have to do? That's another experiment. It's not a formula, but it's raising a very, very interesting set of questions. They're running into some new questions, and the real, um, the real challenge, again, in BC is not to let the questions run underground, not to get dismayed by the fact that there are new dilemmas coming up, because that becomes the leading edge. There are all kinds of ways of, of deconstructing the institution. And the important thing is that we don't, we don't just carry it completely with us on the, on the way back to finding our way back to the community. I'm going to show you two sets of pictures, one very quickly, and then we're going to have a short film just before our coffee break. To, uh, to introduce George's portion of this work. The first set of pictures, whoops. Can you see her okay? It's about one of the families that I was telling you about. This is a friend of ours in, uh, in Winnipeg, who's now 11 years old. She was about eight when that picture was taken, or 10 when that picture was taken. Her name is Amber. And in April, her mom learned about facilitated communication, which is the stuff that Doug Bicklin and Rosemary Crosley are doing from uh, Syracuse University. I promised that I was going to move over, over here so that I don't mess up the video. <laughs> Technology will set us free. Uh, Amber's communications for, for as long as we've known her have been limited to saying yeah and uh, an approximation of I love you. When she first learned facilitated communication, she spelled her mom's name and her dad's name and her grandmother's name. Faye wasn't sure who was doing what because it's kind of a hand over hand system until she spelled that to her mother, I love you, cabbage face. And she knew that something was going on that the mom wasn't in control of. In Canada, uh, there's been a case of a man who was held in jail for 23 years for a crime that it, it seems that he did not commit. And that story was being tracked for a long time. On television. Amber watches TV with her dad all the time because her dad watches the news and, and football on a, on a very regular basis. And it turned out she'd been tracking this story. When David Bilgard got free and she saw the picture of him walking out of Stony Mountain Penitentiary, this is by virtue of a Supreme Court ruling, she called her mom over and indicated with her eyes that she wanted to spell something. And she, and she spelled out this, and it takes her hours to do this, and the kid is in a dead sweat when, when this is done. Good he free, bad law, it's bad to lock people up. They said, tell me about why it's bad to lock people up. Lonely, L-O-N-L-E-Y. Remember, she watched, she's been watching Sesame Street and learning how to spell. And she's been in regular school, but, but never had a way of expressing herself. And then she said, Faye thought she was in, and then she said, I lonely before. Faye said, before what? Adoption, A-D-O-P-T-I-O-N. She was adopted, she was first met when she was in the St. Amant Center, which is a children's institution that unfortunately still operates in, in Winnipeg. She was three years old, uh, with a lot of nursing and physiotherapy, Occupational therapy supports. These were the kids that she lived with. A lot of time, a lot of time spent stacked up against the wall waiting for the next meal or waiting for the next educational event to happen. Can you think of a quicker way to drive language out of a child than to have them live in this kind of context? So Amber said she spent a lot of time tied up in equipment. And she said, I lonely before adoption. And Faye said, how did you feel when we came and adopted you, when we came and got you? 
And she says, this is a great picture. Mars learning something about the wheelchair, and Faye is uh, dealing with somebody about medications. They're both hanging onto her hand because, because they, they needed the connection. They knew she needed the connection. And she says, surprise me. You love me. A child love family. And she went to school the next week and she wrote this in a little book, which we reprinted in the, in the catalog. That's the adoption worker. Pat Cooper, by the way, the adoption worker, met her in the context of a home visit. And then went back to the institution to meet her. And she said, if I hadn't met her at home, I would never have supported the adoption. Because I wouldn't have believed that it would be possible for an ordinary family to take care of a child like this. All those pictures of all the equipment and the, and the special stuff. But she said, I didn't even recognize her. This is literally the first couple of days. She's uh, got a big brother, Chris, who's 24 years old now. Her dad's a Lutheran pastor in Winnipeg. That was about the second Christmas. I love that picture. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> Nothing clinically has changed about this kid. The church is part of our community, Sunday school, other kids, friends. Uh, got into a daycare, sorry about that one, daycare center at the University of Winnipeg. The school division said, there's no way this kid can come to our neighborhood at school. They had a big fight, which actually ended up on national news in Canada and the United States, because they wanted, they wanted her to go to her neighborhood school. The division said, we can't accommodate the kid with this kind of disability. There's no way. And she said, I absolutely refuse to send her to a segregated school halfway across town. She would have actually taken care of her at home. She, she started a human rights suit, but we knew that that would take a long time. Her best friend, Judy Shapiro, said, why don't you come to our school, which is the I.L. Peretz Folk School, the Talmud Torah School, and talk to us. And Faye said, we're not Jewish. Judy said, that doesn't matter. Come and talk. The principal of the school, this beautiful man named Larry, Ge uh, Larry Geller, who's a poet as well as a school principal, looked at the kid, met the family, and he said, I don't know anything about cerebral palsy. I don't know anything about special education. And he looked at her and he said, but this kid needs sanctuary, and we know how to do that. And he brought her into the school, and that broke the back of the school division's idea that she couldn't be in a regular classroom. So the, the next year they accepted her. Well, there's Larry. God bless him, he's in Israel now. I'll go through this very, very fast. This is just some of the surround, some of the things that kids learn to do. She moved back into, they just moved, and she moved into the neighborhood where these kids came from. Three little kids, on the phone one day, three little kids came to visit her from her old school, and they've been palling around ever since. There's been all these questions all the way along about how much does she know, is she really smart, is she just one of the cute ones. The facilitated communication thing is blowing that all out of the water. But the commitment all the way through was, it doesn't matter that we can't figure out how much she's learning. It's important to keep her plugged in. Breaking these together, that's one of her best friends. She and her best friend came to Toronto with us to do a presentation a while back. Amber typed out on her facilitated communication thing, I go to Toronto, uh, C Tower, which is the CN Tower, test my fear. And uh, Robin did the same thing. Robin made one of the presentations at this conference. This is a great picture. The, uh, I think these guys are all going to be lawyers and corporation executives. So I will believe you with. There's a right relationship in that situation between the family and the friends and the commitment surrounding the family and the professional activity of the community, the special devices and physiotherapy and, and communication technology and things that we, that we know we still need to be able to deliver in a reliable way. 
I'm going to end by showing a film, and then we'll have and then we'll have a coffee break, and we'll make sure that you've got a full 20 minutes for the for the coffee break. But this would be a good way to to kind of change pace here a little bit, and then uh, and then George will take over. She's living with us for two years now. And watching her interact with John particularly is real special oh, to me. Look at that, John. Yeah. Isn't he wonderful? Mm -hmm. Look at that. But it doesn't mean everything. I did not take John home saying, I'll show you all. He will do wonderful things. That was not true. I, I believed them. I thought they knew. I didn't know. I just felt that that's what I had to do. My husband at one time said, well, I can see that either you're going to go with him or he's going to come with us. I realized that I could never again totally need anybody or lean on anybody or blame anybody for anything I did because I had to be responsible for what I did because only me was I going to have to answer to, you know? And that was major, major change for me. And when I tell John that he's been a major teacher, it started right there. When he was just going, goo goo. <laughs> Wanna see a funny one? A cute funny one? Not a funny one, a cute funny one. Look at how messy we were we're eating. Just like all the other guys. Here's that one of you on the swing. Oh, look at this. <laughs> You're like, 
Funny, isn't it, to look back? John was the second of six children in the McGow family. Within the family, John's differences, his handicaps, if you will, were minimized. He was just another one of the kids, included in all of the events of a growing family. All of the play, all of the work, all the responsibilities. John's growth, physically, mentally, and socially, surpassed all of the low expectations placed on him at birth, and he continually proved himself to be much more of a blessing than a burden. The medical experts were surprised at John's progress, but warned Lee that she shouldn't get her hopes up. They said that John would probably not live beyond age 20, and that he would never reach more than age 7, mentally. I was told that he probably would not read, that he didn't have uh, something about conceptual ability. And I said, but he knows his alphabet, because we had taught him his alphabet at home. Yes, I know, but he cannot group uh, the letters into a word and understand the concept. And we came up with the idea somehow of labeling things in the house with words. So we got white poster board and we cut strips this high and we got a big thick black marker and we labeled everything in the house except in the living room that we could label. We put a sign over his bed where he slept at night that said ceiling, C-E-I-L-I-N-G. One on the stove that said stove, one on the refrigerator, chairs, walls, floor, sinks, I don't know, whatever we could come up with, windows, doors. And then one day, I took all the signs down. And I sat down on the sofa in Belt Cape, Long Island, with John McGow. Are you trying to sit? Do you want to sit on the chair? And we stacked the signs up. Now they were not at all near their things. And said, tell me any of these that you know. And you told me the name of every single one. I'm going to read a book. Uh, I knew my mother. Uh, mother did sat on her egg. And I remember my husband saying, well, I'm not so sure you should get too excited. Um, that's just sight reading. And I did get apprehensive. I remember that too. I remember thinking, yeah, don't get your hopes up too high. Maybe this isn't such a big deal. But my heart was on my mouth, and my head was pounding. And going through them again, one at a time, and he named every single one. He came to a kitten, are you my mother? He said to the kitten, not yet, not yet, not yet. He came to a kitten, are you my mother? He said to the kitten, the kitten, shut up and look. He did not say a thing. <laughs> the kids started. The kids started. And I looked at Edward and I said, something is happening here because this doesn't make sense from what, again, the authorities at school, the psychologists had told me. And that's very interesting for me to say because what I'm telling you is that he was the first and best excuse I've ever had in my life to come from a whole different way of, call it intuition or heart or feeling, not through data. One of the facts, the data, if you will, they told Lee when John was born, was that if she took John home, she would be ruining the life of her son Edward and any other children that she might have. That fear stayed with her a long time. She was always wondering what was going to happen to Edward I think we should all be thankful for being together, for being here, for having one another, for having this time. It is unique, it is special, and we shouldn't forget where it comes from. Thank you. John made me realize early in my life that things that are different are not necessarily bad to have into your life. 
He gave me and all of us a different viewpoint. Ed was in the Army during the last stages of the Vietnam War. He told me how John had helped him when he returned home. I was uh, kind of numb. Um, I wasn't allowing too much in. It was also at that time that John was finishing up his school. Living in Los Angeles, that school system was John's entire world. There were no friends in the neighborhood who accepted him for who he was. There were no other children that he could play with, that he could talk to, that said hello to him on the street. Everybody kind of avoided him, just like we all do with people that are are obviously handicapped and disabled. And what I didn't realize at the time was that John's world, as he knew it, his entire world, the people that he saw every day and had seen every day for years, the people that he talked to, the people that he played with, the teachers that he talked to, the only human beings that would really communicate to him as a human being that world was coming to an end. And when I realized it was when we went to his graduation, and out of all these kids that were coming out of the class, John was one who either was chosen or decided that he had something to say. John got up to the podium and very somberly um, kind of gathered himself and said, I just need to tell you all that I will miss all of you with all my heart forever. And I remember at that time having my ice cold, hard, shell shock exterior crack. I knew right then and there that he was aware that his entire world, as he knew it, was coming to an end. I don't think John did very well for the next uh, couple of years in Los Angeles. There were times when he became very ill. There were times when he said, I think I've had enough, and proceeded to get very ill. And then John's life changed. His mother, Lee, who had been divorced for 10 years, remarried and moved her family from the city to the small town of Mendocino on the Northern California coast. And the change between Los Angeles and Mendocino is one of a rebirth as far as I can tell. All of a sudden when he came to Mendocino, the average person on the street would say, well, oh, hey, John. Hi. Yeah. And all of a sudden, the world began to grow and expand again. And there were people that showed concern and care of him.
know he lived here a short while. And John started talking about his feeling of open arms for me in this town. Uh, I didn't know what he meant at first. And then I'd think about it and I'd watch. And sometimes he'd go into the post office and get the mail, but it would take him 15 minutes. Oh, I did. I know. And I'd see people were interacting with him, and I'd think, wow, that's me. And then he'd come out, and he'd, he'd look stunned. <coughs> you know, like, and I'd say, well, John, what happened in there? Nice folks talking with you, huh? And he'd say, that's right. It's amazing for me here. It's my safe and stunning new life. Here we go. Louis Dimitri became John's first real friend outside the family. I don't know, if, you know, it, it looks like a, a roaring good time on the outside, but we like to pursue the groove. We both get great pleasure from being able to generate a groove with drums. We, we both love music and we both believe that we are you know, everybody is part of the same family. And that uh, music and communication and understanding and eventually peace, peaceful cooperation on Earth are all our, our, our goals. And we are just the same. We are just the same. Dream, dream together, eat together, Laugh contagious together and go up in and out of the ball together. <laughs> we will live the mind and what life is about her. me and the sky over here and a human talking about her. Bring the good things to life for the for the people all over the town. For the first time in John's life, he was accepted as a valuable member of the community outside of his family. Certainly, he had opportunities and friends he had only dreamt of before. After we lived in Mendocino a few months, John was beginning to get accustomed to the acceptance and the freedom that he found here. And he came to me one day and he said, I have something to tell you. And I said, really? What's that? And he said, now I will start my art. <laughs>
John's art teacher, Mark Eames. When John approaches a piece of artwork that he's going to be doing, he doesn't have any preconceived notions as to what it's going to be when he's finished. Who's going to like it? Who's not going to like it? What's it going to be worth? Will it sell? And John doesn't have any of these uh, intellectual trappings. He just is there, putting the paint down, making these shapes, enjoying that process at that very moment. And that's one of the main reasons that uh, his work is so fresh and alive. <coughs> After about nine months of doing these paintings, I, I came to Lydia's mother and I said, you know, I think you have a real strong body of work right now. I've got lots and lots of paintings. And I think it would be fun for him to have an art show in town. And she was a little surprised and taken back and said, well, I don't know. What are you, are you, are you serious? What are you doing? <laughs> I said, sure, it's, you know, but he's got some great works here. I think we should share them with the community. And it was an enormous uh, success on many levels. There were a lot of people there. I think all but about three or four of the 28 paintings sold. I really like the one straight down there with the nose and the rock. You almost have to have room with it. You sent her around one of these pictures. I didn't think you'd be doing the house with it. So you had a lot of people buying the works partly because they knew John, but you also had a lot of people buying the works because they realized that they're great works of art. How do you feel about at his art show, John was being interviewed by a newspaper reporter, and she asked him what did he think about when he was painting, and he said, I don't think about it, and she said, you don't think about it, you don't like to think about it, and he said, no, no, it's not that, if I think, I don't feel, and if I don't feel, I don't know. John, let me ask you another question okay. about your art. Oh, okay. Yeah. I want to ask you how you feel when you're painting. It was like sound of those on the sea. Sounds good. John's 
tremendous asset to the community. And I don't know if I can verbalize why. From God. dismiss if that was what you hope to do. Once you make contact with John, once you really spend the time or the effort to make contact with John, you find out that there's a very special person there who has a lot to offer. Thing to happen. 
that thing won't happen. Something else will happen. That's so not to fit the preconceived ideas of what a John should be doing or being. And then you'll be, in effect, popped out. So the thing about a, a, about a, a some um, attitude problems and uh, and I wanna um, just let them know um, who they really are and and what I'm saying is um, I, I wanna let the whole world knows about of who they really are, what what they are by themselves, and and be who they are really are, and and show themselves. That's all. Thank you. That's all. That's all. I know. John came to me one day and he said, I know what I want to do for my birthday. I'd like to have a great big party for all my friends and pals from my whole town family. Come, have a great fun time, pop out of the drama, remember who they are, and enjoy. Finally, I felt like I was beginning to understand what I'd witnessed at John's birthday party. The more I'd learned about John, the more I was forced to look at myself and my prejudice to pop out of my preconceived notions of what job or anyone should be. I would I would I would I I I Open for uh, happiness to uh, beautiful times, and uh, and I feel my love <coughs> demons in me for the people who who I see right now. Right now, I request is especially my mom. <laughs> Let's take a 15, 20 minute coffee break, come back and hear from George. 